Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Brian from USA Cards. This is how I got here. Anytime I watch someone being interviewed or talking about, you know, re-entering the hobby, the, the main question they're always asked is, how did how did you get here? How did you return to the hobby? Tell me about your collecting journey. When did you start? You know, and it varies for people depending on their age, and it varies depending on what, you know, they want to do in this hobby. A lot of people got in during COVID and they, they saw the dollar signs. They continue to um, do the things that it takes to make money in this thing. And money comes first and that's all fine and good. And some people are just addicted to collecting and addicted to nostalgia and love sports and all the things above. Um, and that kind of is me. I mean, let's face it. It's all about money. You know, in the end, you buy a card when it's cheap, either to flip it to make money or to uh, have a better card down the line that you got cheaper than what it is worth, you know, down the line. And um, everyone's hobby journey is is different. Everyone's starting point is different. I'm almost 50 years old. So I started back in the early 80s and I guess that's a good place to start my hobby journey and how I got to this point on this day making this video. Let me tell you what it all started with. <laughs> it all started with this card right here. 1984 Topps Traded Gooden. Dwight Gooden was my absolute idol. Um, back in the early, maybe 84, 85, 86 is kind of when I was gaining sports consciousness. I was in love with Michael Jackson and I was in love with, with Dwight Gooden. Um, a friend of mine had this. He had the 84 Tops traded set. He lived down the street. He came to my house to trade and I stole this from him. I've told that story before. I stole the 84 Tops traded Gooden. That's how much I loved Gooden. I was not uh, beyond taking things that did not belong to me back then. Uh, but I was just a kid, and that's how much I loved this card. Of course, his mother quickly realized that he did not come home. I mean, everybody loved Dwight Gooden back then. Um, his mom realized he did not come back with the card and called my mom. And as moms often do, they figured it out, and the card was returned. But this is, uh, this is my favorite card of all time. It will always be my favorite card of all time. And I got a chance to meet. Dwight Gooden at the Dallas Card Show a couple years ago, and I couldn't express to him in the you know minute and a half that I had with him what he meant to me as a kid and how how glad I am that he is still with us, considering that you know he had a really serious drug addiction that really derailed his career. So, but I got to meet him, and he was every bit of the guy I'd hoped he'd be. So. This is the card that kicked it off for me when I was a kid. Now I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit in years. Uh, Cause I have an older card, I have older cards. So this is not necessarily chronological in terms of the years of the cards, but this was the next card that I fell madly in love with. Of course, it's the 85 tops, US Olympics, Mark McGuire, extended rookie. If you're anywhere near my age, you, probably also felt fondly for this card. I mean, you know, this back in 87, McGuire hit 49 home runs, I believe. He was everybody's favorite uh, baseball player back then, um, just because he was an exciting rookie. And this card really drove the hobby um, back in the mid 80s. And I think is responsible for a lot of the accelerated growth that it had into the junk wax era. Um, I actually, my my grandparents bought me a 1985 top set for Christmas in 1985. I would have been 10 years old. And of course I was putting that set in binders and rearranging it almost every day. And um, I had the best cards in the first page. Of course, this was, this was the best card. And when I, when I moved to Texas, I was living in Florida at the time. When I moved to Texas, there was a card store in McKinney, Texas. Uh, ran by some an old couple 
They used to smoke in the card shop and they used to do basically trade nights before there was such a thing as trade nights. And they had them at the, the city library and it was just an excuse to see what kids wandered in that they could pilfer cards off of. And that's exactly what they did to me. They got my prized Mark McGuire from me for a freaking minor league card that I had no idea wasn't as valuable as this. I thought, oh, minor league card? Man, that was before he was even in the majors. Of course, this was before he was even in the minor leagues, but I ended up trading it. I ended up hating those people once I realized I got swindled. Um, and then I, I picked this up, you know, a few years ago at the Dallas show for a hundred bucks, the nine. So yeah, this was card number two in my journey. Let me skip over to this. So I grew up in Missouri. I'm from Missouri and always been a huge Royals fan. And this Brett rookie was sort of my only dip into vintage really up until this point. I've never, I've had, I've, I've owned a couple Mickey Mantles here and there, but I owned them and I sold them and I sold them way too early. I bought them back in like 2017. This card here is impossible to find centered. And this is only a six, but I think it's the most centered version I've ever seen of this card, at least on the front. The back's a little different, but it's way left to right. But man, the front vintage it's all about eye appeal correct so um i remember staring at a copy of this card in a little card store in joplin missouri called vintage card stock and um i would just stare at the, i would just stare at the card in the case and it was way out of my reach i was buying 88 score back then but this was another one i hurried back to get when i re-entered the hobby so pretty special card to me uh, where should I go from here? These are all, I, I picked all these cards up within the past probably five years, six years. So it's not like I have any of these from my childhood. But I remember when COVID started to uh, happen and the, I remember the prices started to explode. And the way I, I figured that out was... I had purchased a 1989 Upper Deck Griffey PSA 10 for $400 at a Dallas card show, back when the Dallas card show was like 30 tables. And a friend of mine reached out and was like, hey man, have you seen these Griffies? They're doing like, I don't remember, like maybe maybe like 1,200. I was like, what? And then I just watched it go and climb all the way up to, I think mid 2Ks. I mean, I don't know what the, the high point on that 89 Griffey was, but I, I moved mine in a trade and I forgot what value I, I got on it, but I definitely made a little money. Anyway, when that was happening, I was like, all right, if the Griffey is jumping, what other super iconic cards are next? I wanted to get out in front of the trend because obviously there were a ton of people coming back into the hobby, probably a ton of people my age that you know, had money and rediscovered the hobby and went back to get all these great cards from their childhood. And I was immediately drawn to this card. And I picked this card up for like 600 bucks, the Henderson nine rookie from 80 tops. I think now it sits around 1800, but yeah, I, I should have bought a lot of these. Um, but back then I was chasing my homes, which wasn't a bad thing. Uh, and I was chasing Lucas, but I <laughs> I snagged this Henderson and then it exploded and I've just held on to it because I everybody needs a Ricky Henderson rookie in their collection, in my opinion. And then the rest are just cards that I never could have as a kid. I mean, if you had an 82 tops traded Cal Ripken when I was a kid, y you were either a dealer's kid or you had an uncle or a dad that collected and, and it belonged to him, right? No kids were walking around with these cards back then. So I went and picked this up. Now I got all these in nines just because the tens are impossible. I mean, they're just impossible. I couldn't have as many of these nostalgic cards as I want if I was trying to you know, keep that PSA 10 standard. The 84 Fleer update Kirby Puckett and the 84 Fleer update Roger Clemens, both untouchable 
cards in my early collection experience. Again, if you saw these, they belonged to an adult back when I was a kid. Um, just out of reach cards, amazing cards. I went back and picked these up and they've probably come down a bit from where I got them, but um, they're, they're, they're holding their value. They definitely have not, they have not decreased by 50% like a lot of the stuff has since COVID. I don't know how high these got, but, and I haven't comped them in a while, but I can't imagine that they um, have fallen too, too much. And I never liked Clemens. Uh, I was always a good guy, but those two loved Mattingly. And, and this is another one of those sophisticated cards that no kids had. Uh, I mean, people, people just, you know, 84 Donruss was like, I mean, it, it, it was a set and, and, a, and a box of cards that you just did not buy. <laughs> or at least I didn't. Again, it was the adults that were dabbling in Donruss. 84 Donruss and 84 Fleer updates. Uh, and Tiffany's, right? Here's an 84 Tiffany um, Don Mattingly rookie. The kids were, you know, 87 tops, 85 tops. It was always tops stuff for the kids. And then score came along and it was some score stuff. It was Donruss, right? 88 Donruss comes to mind. 87 Fleer with the blue borders. But these early 80s Donruss and Tiffany sets were just, uh, they just were for adults and not for kids. So it was, uh, it was really fun to go back. You know what's interesting? If you ever get a chance to hold one of these 84 Donruss or any of these really early uh, 80s cards they're really flimsy they almost don't feel real i've i've seen some raw and i thought they were fakes because they're just so thin but um but they're not i mean that's just the way the card stock was back then bo jackson one of my all-time favorites somebody i pc to this day the 86 tops traded set iconic loved it uh, wasn't necessarily a fan of 86 tops uh, but I love the 86 tops traded set. So I'm, uh, I, I bought this early too, before it jumped. And so I do have this in a 10 and then I've got the bonds. I picked this up for 20, $20 at a show. I think the nines are pretty, or the tens are pretty affordable. I think they're 300 or less. Oh, look at this 87 toys are us, man. It was like, KB Toys was making cards. Toys R Us was making cards. So uh, there were all kinds of little different like toy companies that were pumping out cards in the junk wax era. But this is a really cool card. And it's a rookie. So um, found this at the Dallas show a while back. Grabbed it for an all black border card. Uh, this is pretty, pretty good condition. Pretty hard to get a 10 on this. But I loved Bonds. Truth be told, I was more of a Bonilla guy, like I think probably a lot of people were, because when they both hit the scene at the same time, Bobby Bonilla was better. Again, with Tiffany, uh, you know, about Topps Tiffany, if you don't know about Tiffany, Tiffany is the, uh, what is it, like a like a fine, uh, like, what do they make, like dishware and stuff? I, you know, I don't know. I think, I think so. Breakfast at Tiffany's uh, was the movie with uh, Audrey Hepburn, who... Incidentally, I have a tattoo of my arm for, um, well, just because. Uh, it's a classic, classic photo. And uh, girl down in Austin does immaculate black and white uh, tattoos, portrait tattoos only. So anyway, uh, yep, that same Tiffany uh, was making tops cards. And they're glossy on the front. They're more rare, although I think it's 84. Five and below are limited to 5,000 copies. And then after 86, I think they bumped it up to print run up to like 30K. So this is a nice card, but I think it's only a, in a nine. I think this XRC Will Clark Tiffany is maybe 200 bucks, 100, 150 bucks, something like that. But like your 84 tops traded stuff, like that Gooden, and a Tiffany would be, well, I've priced it. It's like 
1500 bucks this this card and i have a an 85 tiffany but i'd love to get a 10 a tiffany 10 but like i said it's like 1500 bucks so tiffany yes look for tiffany's if you if you want a, a junk a junk wax era card but you just kind of want to um spend a little more have a little more rarity type of deal then you can get a tiffany version will clark uh, 86 top trader. Will Clark was always one of my favorites, so grab this. It was really cheap, like 50 bucks. Then the 92 Donner Salute in the early 90s. I I kind of got out of the hobby. I was in high school. I was playing baseball. I was like really into music. I mean, that what a time for music. Nirvana and Pearl Jam, and then Smashing Pumpkins, and then you know, girls took my attention and just my time away from sports cards. So I missed the Donruss Elite stuff. But when I found out about it, I went back and um, kind of re-educated myself on all the early 90s. And really, the, the whole 90s for me was lost in cards because I just was in college and not collecting. Uh, but I had to go back and get this. Uh, really cool. Really neat set, really rare. I think it's numbered out of 10,000. Yeah, 4421 out of 10,000. So, I mean, obviously something numbered out of 10,000 today would, would probably be laughed at, but um, this. So I always loved Mark Grace too. Mark Grace, Will Clark, both those guys. But uh, this score, I love to score. And score had its own version of a premium uh, sets and that was you know instead of tops and Tiffany it was score and and just they made a glossy set you know Tiffany was was glo was the glossy set for tops score glossy was the glossy set for score uh, but this is uh, Mark Grace's um, XRC I think I know eighty eight Donruss uh, yeah. I know 88 Donruss was his rookie. So, uh, cause it was a rated rookie and I was always trying to get as many of those as I could. I wanted a whole page in my notebook, a rated rookie, Mark Grace's. But I went back and found this pretty early on in my return. Um, now I'm just kind of running out of ideas for like cards from my childhood that I'm, that I kind of, must own here's one this was always ever elusive you were you were lucky to see one of these the chipper jones desert shield so i'm sure you know the story of these they were given to soldiers that went to the first iraq war and um, a lot of them didn't come back and the ones that did come back came back uh really beat up you know over in the middle of the desert all that sand can't be good for these cards and I've heard stories of uh, collectors and dealers standing outside of the where the the big ships would dock when these when these guys would come back on on naval ships or even airplanes, and they would sit out outside the gates and just ask them if they had any Desert Shield sets to sell them, and they would they would often sell them to these dealers. And you know, years later, this uh, Chipper Jones rookie is pretty special. I would move this. Um, but just would have to be in the right deal, I guess. And so uh, the remaining pile here is just sort of um, my re-entry point. Uh, so I'll tell that story quickly. Uh, the way I re-entered was my son was born in 2007. And so in, in 2016 is about when I got back in. He was nine, 10 years old. He collected Pokemon. And we were always buying Pokemon packs and ripping Pokemon packs all the time. And once uh, I decided he was old enough, I wanted to take him down to a sports uh, card shop. And we started ripping 2016 Stadium Club down at Nick's Cards in Dallas. And we were about six packs in. They were about six or seven bucks each, I remember. And he pulled this one of one Carlos Correa, black and white. Uh, with an on-card auto, there's the one of one, and we had no idea what we what we had just pulled. I mean, I knew who Carlos Correa was. He was in his second year. <clears throat> he was 
he was every, every bit of um, what Bobby Witt Jr. is right now. I mean, talk about uh, a, a bonus baby, a hype darling. I mean, he was the number one pick in 2015, and he was on the cover of 2016 Stadium Club. And I remember Nick, the owner, got super excited, took a picture of my son, put it in his newsletter, uh, and then I remember driving home that day and, and just feeling something inside of me re-engage. Um, I guess you could say it was the, the spark uh, to get back into cards, but I just knew that I had rediscovered something. And now that I had a little bit of money, I knew that was the beginning of a journey, not necessarily for my son, but, but definitely for me. And so Keaton has always been an excuse, right? To to uh to take him to card shoot shows and card shops and but really if the truth is is to be told it, it it was just as much for me as anything else um i was the kid in the candy store not him he still to this day would prefer one piece over sports cards although he is he is coming over to the sports card side and he does have some cards that that he's asked for that he's purchased um so it's it's pretty exciting, and now he loves going to the Dallas Card Show every every other month. So, but yeah, this is the one. This is what like hook, line, and sinkered us right back in, or me. And it just so happened that in 2016, Dak and Zeke hit the scene, and we used to open this product right here called Tops Black. Sorry, Panini Black Gold, and we loved it. Um, of course, we didn't know anything about anything back then. I remember discovering what a Raz was. I remember discovering what a break was. I remember watching Breakers TV and watching Platinum Cards. Um, so, I mean, just by getting in in 2016, I was way ahead of the entire like rest of the 40-somethings that were, that were coming down the pike. Now... There were, I mean, I understand there were people that never left that were, you know, in this thing the whole time. I mean, I missed, sorry about the noise. I missed the LeBron stuff. I missed the Brady stuff. I missed the Trout stuff. But I was here for Dak, Zeke, Luka, Otani, Mahomes, and then the names go on and on. But this card I pulled out because this was a... Um, man, there's like a little white spot in there driving me crazy. This was a jersey number card that we hit. So we hit this out of black gold. It's a rookie gold mine. And Zeke, I'm, let me tell you, I mean, he was, <clears throat> in Dallas especially, he was worth collecting. He, he was hyped. And then when Dak came in and had the rookie year that he had I mean it was a great time to be a collector in Dallas but we hit this it's out of out of 50 but it's his jersey number 21 out of 50 so this will always stay in the collection um, it's not the biggest card ever by any stretch but for me and, and Keaton and Keaton was even excited you know uh, it's it'll forever be a you know a moment so um the moments uh, that you can commemorate with some of these cards are pretty cool. Uh, and then, yeah, the last two cards I have to show you. So uh, I remember watching Pat Mahomes at Texas Tech. I remember his dad pitching for the Mets and the Rangers for for a little while. I knew who Patrick Mahomes was, and I was I would watch the the uh, Big Twelve games when he was playing for Texas Tech because they'd be on here in the region on Saturdays and I remember thinking that guy is really good uh, he's got a good arm uh, he was you know it was the Red Raider uh, offense where you know it was just throw the ball everywhere he was racking up huge numbers and then he got drafted by the Chiefs and I and you know of course everybody was on Mahomes back then. Um, he was one of, of many quarterbacks that were being chased and players that were being chased. But I just remember going all in on Mahomes. So I purchased this. I purchased this one of one National Treasures booklet because I didn't at the time know that booklets were a no-no, that booklets were not going to hold their value long term. 
purchased it on eBay for, for 1800 bucks and, uh, tucked it away, was proud as hell of it, set it on my desk and watch my homes, uh, go throw 50 touchdowns in his essentially, you know, first full year as quarterback, uh, lose to Brady in the playoffs and then win a Super Bowl. And that card went nuts. And I ended up selling that card for an amount of money that has been propelling my entire hobby experience ever since. Um, this card right here was worth $100,000 at the time. And this was part, just part of the trade. Um, I should have sold it. When I made that trade, I got a ton of cash. And I got this and I was uh, super excited. I mean, I had dealers telling me that they would rather have this than the booklet alone. And I got a ton of cash plus this. So I felt really good about that trade. I drove all the way up to St. Louis in one day to make the trade in a McDonald's parking lot with a guy that had been asking me about my Mahomes since he saw me post it on Instagram. Uh, he was a Mahomes super collector, and uh, so I, I I was thrilled to have this and a bunch of cash. Got offered ninety thousand dollars for this about a week after I uh, traded for it, and I told him no. <laughs> now I'd probably take thirty. I'd probably take thirty five now. But uh, you know, I, every day that I have this in my collection is a pretty cool day because. I really have no business holding $30,000 in a piece of cardboard, but here we are. And to me, I mean, I got it for essentially, I mean, free uh, compared to what, I mean, an $1,800 investment turned into it, essentially everything I have in this room. Um, I remember buying this for 250 bucks. Now, um, this is not play, this is not game used, it's player worn, but all his stuff is player worn as I understand it. Second year, Mahomes. I had so many Mahomes, man. Gosh. And I remember buying, I could have bought probably five National Treasures, true RPAs. But I just felt bad about spending the money. It was at a time when we were making a lot of money and I had a lot of money. And I'm lucky to have come away with what I came away with. But man, if I'd have known then what I know now. So, still have this. This has gone up. I mean, this is probably a 5K card. Bought it for 250. And then this one. So I traded at the time $40,000 in cards. No cash was traded on that. No, no cash was exchanged. But I traded $40,000. And um, I knew this, this, this was a 2020. Yeah. 2020 baseball. This was basically after Biden won the election or stole the election or whatever you want to say. <laughs> but I knew that we hadn't heard the last of Trump and I knew this was going to be an outrageously um, controversial but outrageously amazing card and it took a bunch. Uh, I'll show you what I traded for it. I'll throw it up here. It took, you know, it took a lot of cards at, at back then, like I say, 40 K worth. But, um, I think now those cards are probably around 15, maybe less depending on how much that Curry flawless is. But yeah, this is a, uh, Donald Trump, the only Panini card that's ever featured Trump. It's a one of one, as you can see there comes out of 2020 flawless baseball. It is a real card. I've featured it several times on my Instagram and on my YouTube channels. Uh, if you go back in my videos, I do uh, several, well, maybe a couple videos talking about this trade. And um, so you can get a better breakdown of it. But yeah, I mean, I don't know how much this is worth, you know, I guess it just depends on how things play out. But uh, all those cards that I traded to get this, I bought that curry for 1200 bucks. So, I mean, I think I'm essentially into this, well, for free, when you consider the booklet of Mahomes that I sold, that basically paid for all this stuff. But um, I think I was into that stack of cards that I traded to get this for about maybe 3K. So this is probably a 3K 
card um, in terms of what I'm into it for. And uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, you know, if you were around, you got lucky, you were buying stuff, then it's been a hell of a ride. And if you're just getting here, it's still a hell of a ride, but it's not, it's not anywhere near what it used to be. So uh, just to, just to give you a little taste of where I came from and how I got here. So I don't do any breaks. I don't do any wax. Uh, I don't really grade much. I just target singles that I want. I buy them in PSA 10s or I buy them in the highest grade that I can afford. And, and I hold on to them and I make videos about them and I love them. And then when it's time to move them, like that uh, Luca cracked ice, I move them. Um, and essentially everything is going to be moved at some point, minus what I pass on to my son. And hopefully these two uh, will be passed on because they mean something to me and to him. But curious to know what your journey is. Uh, curious to know where you came from. You know, there's a lot of content on YouTube, but at the end of the day, what content I enjoy is just hearing people's individual stories and looking at their individual collections and listening to them geek out about their stuff. So yeah, geek away and let me know if you uh, have a channel and I'm not aware of it and, or if you start a channel. Um, it's all good stuff. It's all good stuff. So thanks for watching. It's a longer one. But whenever I get days off like this uh, Monday Memorial Day, I try to get something done. Cause I, cause once I go back to school and I start getting up at four 30 in the morning, uh, it is, it's a grind and I can't ever do videos, but Dallas in a week. All right, guys. See you then. Bye.